When is the last time you listened to a podcast about web development, web design, and small business and didn't fall asleep? Yes, we cover web development, web design, and small business, but like actual human beings with personalities. If you're a beginner, we're not going to talk over your head. It's more like asking your buddy for help. We have guests, we have fun, and let me tell you, these two can get off on a tangent. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to HTML All The Things Podcast. This is Matt Lawrence and Mike Curran. That's it, everybody. We are back. This is the HTML All Things Podcast. This episode is titled SEO Tips You Can Implement Today. So I know there's a lot of different SEO things that you can know and learn and dig deep on and things like that. But what I want to focus on in this episode are SEO tips that are hopefully things you could just log into your CMS and start implementing. Go to town on stuff. We're going to touch, just touch on technical SEO, but we're going to get into really sort of defining your website to gain some authority out there, writing more content, of course. We're going to talk about, even though this is something you can't kind of do today, we'll get into it get into it in the episode, then that is uh, backlinks and DR or domain rating. We're also going to be talking about keyword research and why it's an investment in yourself and it's a bit of an investment in your skills. We're going to briefly touch about tools that I use and they're all free if you want to go in and you know kind of check those out but before we do that remember that we also have if you want to support episodes like this we also have a scrimba affiliate link I'm trying to make like a more like extravagant introduction for this but anyway we have a scrimba affiliate link if you want to go and click on that that is in our show notes it's also in the show description if your podcast app supports it and go learn how to code on that platform with their interactive media player code editor or you can pause what the instructor is doing, start messing with the IDE right there, break the code, play with the code, see like, hey, why didn't they do an H2 here? Put the H2 there and see what it does. Go and see. Go and check that out. And again, go check out those links on our website or in the show description. And if this sounds interesting to you and you want to support the show, you can go check us out on that Patreon. Leave a review or rating on your podcast app. Join us in our Discord server or share this with your friends. The classic preamble suffix to my introduction, I guess, is what it is. Anyway. Let's get into the meat and potatoes of this episode. And the very first thing that I want to discuss is defining your website. Now, this is a really difficult thing to sell your clients on sometimes. So let's just kind of zoom out and just think, okay, client comes to you. You're the web developer. They go to you and they say, okay, I got these promo videos made. Uh, You know, I'm trying to sell a product, um, whether it's online or not. It's, you know, it's kind of irrelevant at this point. And I want to promote this thing online. I want a marketing website. And so you go to them and you say, oh, okay. So you run a, let's just say landscaping business. That's a typical, you know, small business that you would make a small sort of standard five pager small business site for. And that's a, that's a classic in the web development world. That's been around for so long, like a standard five pager small business site. And those still exist and they still do help. The problem is, is that these marketing websites and those small business sites would be considered marketing websites are often too sparse on content. And they don't really have a definition. So like I'm saying, you want to define your website. You want to be clear that this is a landscaping site. And when someone goes to the site, even if there isn't a lot of content, and I mean specifically written content is is my forte myself, it's obvious it's a landscaping site, right? It's called like, you know, Matt's Lawn Care or something like that. Uh, It has like lawnmowers and pictures of sort of like trees that they trim and stuff. And it'll say services. We'll, We'll cut lawns. We'll sort of shape bushes, we'll do this and that, whatever, we'll plant flowers, all that stuff. It's it's clearly defined there. The problem is, is that you need, a, a, in my opinion, you need a, like a rich definition for Google. You need to enrich Google in what you're doing. And you do that, again, this is my opinion, is that you, you do that by a clear site definition. And that's exactly why niche sites are so popular. So if we think about a niche site, Let's say you're going, you're starting for square one and you go, I want to make a niche site on enter niche here. I've done the research, you know, there's, there's searching there, people are searching for, I don't know, the best waterfalls or something. Let's just say that is a niche, the best waterfalls. Well, I want to write articles on that. I want to make content on that. So my niche site is about waterfalls and it's really easy to go out of that niche. You can go and start talking about fishing. You know, you could go start talking about rivers. You can go start talking about all these other things. And your site starts to lose definition. You're not as concise as you once were when you said, I'm going to write about the best waterfalls in the world. And 
you can branch out a little bit and say these are the best places to take photos of these waterfalls. You're still within that niche. When you talk to a lot of SEO experts or niche niche site experts, marketing experts, et cetera, et cetera, for online sort of professionals, when they're talking about niche websites, one thing you'll see constantly is they want you to niche down. They don't want you to write about you know, every single type of fishing tackle. They don't want you to write about every single type of uh, waterfall and the river beside it and it all, you know, yada, yada, yada. Like it just, the list goes on. They want you to niche down. Now, I know that niche sites have been hit, or at least some of them have been hit by recent Google updates, right? And so the strategy of like writing a certain amount of articles and then just sort of like letting SEO run its course is sort of wishy-washy right now, whether it'll come back, whether it's recovered now, I don't know. But I, when the, the most recent two Google updates occurred, I heard a lot of complaints. Now, maybe that's the norm. I'm not, I'm not sure. But their advice on how to niche down still holds true. And that is that you want to be creating content on a small, concise niche that clearly defines your site. So another example outside of waterfalls might be something like pocket knives. I want to write about all the like pocket knives. I love how you know there's some of them have scissors and rulers and cool tools and measuring tapes and all kinds of things and lighters. And it's like a cool little hobby to maybe collect old and new pocket knives. But you're not going to niche out or niche up by saying, I'm going to do all bladed tools and weapons. I'm going to go all the way from hedge trimmers through so- like ancient swords and stuff. You're starting to get into the medieval niche then, and it's starting to get a little bit all over the place. So kind of being concise and talking about pocket knives. And then you could kind of niche up a little bit and say like, oh, I'm also going to talk about how to clean them and how to store them. That is, that's the type of thing when they say niche down because you're defining it clearly. Think about a user who comes to your site. They want to see the cool pocket knife that you had, right? They're a pocket knife collector too. They're interested in this one that has a lighter in it. It's like a collector's item. There's only a hundred in the world. You have one, you're doing a review on it. Sure. But that same person that wants to see that may also have a pocket knife collection that they're kind of confused on how to keep them nice over the over the years. Like, do I use these oils? Do I clean them? What do I do? And so you talking about cleaning the pocket knives is a a piece of content that your users would come to come to you for. You have a clear definition that you are talking about pocket knives. So a lot of SEO and this is why I'm talking about this so much is a lot of SEO is is all about making these clear definitions and making these clear distinctions. If we think about one of the technical parts of SEO, which is the headings. So one big thing is, is that headings, let's say from H1 to H6, right? H1 being sort of the main header, the top, the a top line header, right? Maybe even just the title of the page. And then H6 is sort of the lowest heading. Having and using headings in a proper hierarchy is really crucial. So you might say H1 might be how to clean your pocket knives. H2 might be how to clean your pocket knives with oil, H, and then you might have some subheadings there. The next H2 might be how to clean your pocket knives with soap. But let's say that's a really in-depth topic, and there's different soaps, and there's different types of soap, and it's different budgets. So you might have a, an H3 underneath that soap headline, and you might write, you know, this is how you do it with this type of soap. This is how you do it with this type of soap. This type of soap is always on sale. Oh, you can get the powdered form. Whatever, right? And it's all about being clear, concise, and having everything sort of defined. And another thing is, is that you do not want your written content to be keyword stuffed, right? So a lot of times people will say, oh, okay, you know, I've done some keyword research, which we will talk about later in the episode, but I've done some keyword research and I would like to have this keyword, whatever it is, a waterfall, if we use our waterfall example, I want the keyword waterfall everywhere. So you could say, I love waterfalls. Waterfalls are great. Waterfalls are big. Some waterfalls are small. Like it's too many times you're writing waterfalls. And the thing that happens is, is it's not very sort of human readable. And way, 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 way back in the day, which is irrelevant now, but way back in the day, you used to be able to actually have a meta. There's a meta tag, which I think you could still do, but it's not really used anymore, which you used to be able to just put your keywords in a meta tag in a meta HTML tag. And many people would do that. And then they'd also keyword stuff. And then, of course, the search engines at the time were relatively limited. And so they would see like that you wrote waterfall in your meta tag. You also wrote waterfall 1400 times in your article. So I guess you must be all about waterfalls and then all your content will rank. Right. And things are not that simple anymore. So I have like sort of a mentality on how to almost talk to crawlers. And if you don't know what a crawler is, a crawler is sort of the bot that goes around and crawls around the Internet and finds content and categorizes it and says, like, oh, this this is about pocket knives. This is about waterfalls. This is about keyboards, et cetera. 
So now I write in English. I'm going to talk to talk about this like as if I'm writing in English because this is, you know, me giving an example. And what I do is I think of crawlers as someone that has just learned English, but it could be any language. They've just learned the language. And let's say they're pretty much fluent in it, right? They can go to go to somebody and have a chat. But what are they going to struggle with? They're going to struggle with nuance. They're going to struggle with metaphors, you know, lo- locality things like little bits of slang that might be on it for that country or little bits of slang for that town. They're going to struggle with those things. They're going to tr- they're going to struggle with, like, for example, in English, like we use the word ain't, which is technically slang, right? That might not be taught in a formal English class. So the people might be like, what does ain't mean? You know? And so what I'd say to do is you don't have to use all like sort of easy words or anything like that, but just as an idea, the way I think of it in my head is I write things clearly and concisely leaving little to no assumption and nuance. I don't want someone going in there being like, well, wait, like, is it actually like he told me to go to a department store and he mentioned Walmart once like the Zellers work. Wait, Zellers open. You know, like it's a I don't want them to questioning it. So I make it just clear, concise and leave little to mystery to allow the crawler to read it and actually be like, oh, okay, this is about X topic. It's interesting to me. A lot of this advice just sounds like make a good website, uh, make, make it as clear again, make it as clear as possible, as minimal as possible, make it understandable to both robots and humans. Like all of that to me is like, okay, I, I would probably read that site. Like I would probably spend some time on that site, right? Which in turn, I guess is the metric that is one of the most important in all this is like, if you make good content, regardless of how you're gaming the system or not, like if there is a gaming of the system, whatever, um, or you're, you know, you're playing the games, how, however they are. The end goal is to get a person to stay on your site for as long as possible to get them as much information as they possibly can. And that will in turn lead to a better rating or and a better and a, a better SEO, better, better everything. So like it, this is one of the hardest things with SEO <laughs> is that, yes, you have to play this game of making sure that it follows the right structure, it's clear, it's defined, everything. But then you also have to like provide the right things in your on your site to allow the user to stay there. And like the balance there, to me, is probably one of the hardest things um, to achieve. But it's also like, it shows that it's doable. You know what I mean? Like if, if, if you have something that you're passionate writing about, you're a good writer, all of the stuff that Matt's going to tell you that's the one that that's the steps that you have to take. And then you just do your thing. Like you're the thing that you're really good at. And most likely it'll work out for you at the end of the day. I think there's a lot of patience involved. There's a lot of like, you know, testing a, a B testing, but like, it's just clear, really well-written content usually does well. And that seems like a very obvious thing to say, but I think people always think that there's some sort of game that every website plays but the reality is, is that like outside of all these little things that you have to adhere to, like the H, the headings and the, 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 the proper meta tags and stuff like that, writing something interesting and useful is the end goal. Um, if you're not doing that, probably won't be successful. And, and one of the struggles is you can be really clear and concise with slogans and just little lines of text. So we talked about how it's really hard for clients sometimes or it's really hard for web dev agencies to sell clients on writing content or having content written because they see it as, well, hey, I'm running this landscaping business. All I need to do is write my pricing chart. I need to write that I cut lawns in this town, this city, this area, and that's good enough. And you can explain it kind of until you're blue in the face that no, like that isn't good enough in most cases. Is all this stuff, you know, have a bit of nuance to it, SEO? Of course it does, right? There's Google updates, Maybe Google is absolutely starved for your client's website. Maybe there's absolutely no landscapers in that area. And so it'll pick it up. Sure. You know, there, there, there may be some success, success stories there. Maybe your, maybe your um, client wants to pay to be at the top of certain keywords via paying for Google ads. There, that's, you know, there's a bunch of nuance to this, right? But what I'm talking about is trying to get into that organic, those organic search results. You want to be in as many search results that are related to your niche as possible. And so you don't want to keyword stuff like I mentioned, but you also want to have sort of a, a meteor article because it, it needs to be something more that they can read on, right? Like how authoritative is just a heading that says lawn cutting services and then a little subheading that says we cut lawns in Toronto, Ontario. 
it's like, okay, like that's clear. That's concise. Like I said, but there's not a lot of meat there. And so someone reading it or the crawler reading it is going to be like, oh, okay, cool. But there's no more here. There's no more for me to read. There's no more for me to like kind of understand or anything like that. Like, are you going to be doing the edging of the sort of grass area with a like with a weed whacker? Do you use fertilizer? What kind of fertilizer is it, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's all these sort of nuances and things that can make a website that seemingly small, like a standard five pager, you can really fill that thing out. And realistically, it should be more than five pages at that point. There should be sort of a blog section or at least some additional content pages that really sort of, you know, add some beef to like give yourself some authority, which is something that we are going to talk about in, in a bit. And writing more content sort of is the the start of this or like the one of the big things that I always fight clients on is you need to write more content. Now, that's easier said than done. I'm not going to just, you know, obviously it's easy to say that people have been saying that in SEO for years, easier said than done. But I like to think of writing more content as an instruction manual. So just think you went, you went and you bought something, whatever it is, you bought a lawnmower and you have to assemble it yourself. And then you put, and then you start using it, right? You have to assemble it to some degree. Okay. Well, if there's not enough instruction in the manual, the manual is useless at the end of the day. It doesn't tell you how to attach the handle, the motors in pieces, you know, is it gas, is it electric, doesn't tell me. Great. This, this manual is useless. But what if you have too much? You can have too much instruction. What if most of it's fluff? It, start, it starts talking about the company's other products to cross-sell you. It starts talking about the gas engine version of the electric mower that you bought. They're the same series of mower, but there's a gas and an electric option. And it starts talking about the gas one. And you're like, man, I can skip these 18 steps and there's only 20. And what's going on here? This is almost like keyword stuffing where the instruction manual is too bloated. There's too much instruction. There's too much cross sell. But if the instruction manual is just right, and this is hard to do, if it's just right and concise, it tells the users what they need to do and when that's it. They could, they go straight to the person and they go, okay, this is how you set up the handle. You need to set up the handle first because then you attach it to the body. Now everything is nice and you know concise and put together. Now we put the wheels on. Okay, now put the brakes on. Now we now we want to put the engine on. Now we put the pull cord on or the button if it's some sort of electric device. And this is how you fill the tank, right? It doesn't go, this is how you fill the tank. By the way, you want to use gasoline, but we have diesel engines, diesel engines, you know, and then it goes off. Like that's that's keyword stuffing. That's just nonsense. It's trying to cross sell. And and, and how authoritative is that manual? How concise? of a definition is that manual. It's not, it's just talking about all of whatever company's lawnmower products. Like it's, it's going off, it's going off target at the end of the day. So an instruction manual to me is a really good analogy. And it's something that I try to keep in my mind a lot because we write a fair, we write a fair bit of uh, coding tutorials on our website for Webflow, for CSS and those type of things. Um, And uh, so I think some JS ones as well, Uh, but some of the JS, some JS ones are certainly coming. But the point is, is that you need to kind of keep it concise. And actually, just to just to be clear, like even in this podcast, like just right there, when I started talking about JS and I stopped myself, that's me not trying to keyword stuff. You, you're you here to hear about this writing content thing. You're not here to hear about, oh, I also have JS tutorials. Have you checked out? You know, that's for the beginning and the end of the show. And, the, you know, some some shameless self plugging. Sure. But keeping it concise. Right. So you want to target your content at what your users will want or need to read. So, for example, and I have a couple here, a web hosting company will get away from the lawn mowers and stuff like that. We'll bring it back to tech, a web hosting company. What are they going to write about? Well, they might write about hosting types. They offer VPS. They offer shared. They offer managed uh, options on some of them. And, you know, the list goes on. So what are they going to write about? They're going to say, what is shared hosting? Shared hosting is this, blah, blah, blah. And that is a useful piece of content. For anyone that is using their service, maybe they're trying to shop through the options. Oh, do I want VPS? Do I want shared? But it's also useful to the community at large, right? So there has some like sort of grand appeal. And then if someone who is not their customer currently or looking to be their customer is just looking for what shared hosting is, there's an opportunity to cross sell there where you read about the article all the way through and you say like, oh, shared hosting is this, 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 blah, 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 blah. But maybe there is a paragraph in there where you mention say, hey, most shared hosting doesn't use SSDs. Ours uses SSDs. We have better performance. Here's a coupon. Go buy it. Right. There's still like a selling angle. There's still going to be a little bit of fluff. There needs to be sort of like 
there's no like perfect answer here, right? It's kind of like anything in life. It's not like one way or the other. It's somewhere in between. And it's sort of like you need to be concise, but you also need to sell a bit too, right? In general, right? Um, and uh, like, for example, on our website, we, you're going to see some ads unless you have an ad blocker. And like, that's technically fluff. Like you're not, you didn't go to my website to see the ad, of course, but we need to make some money off the site. So it just makes sense. Another one here. Another example is a company that sells smartphones may write guides on setting the phone up and how to install some useful apps that are relevant to their customers. And you can see there where they can get the ball rolling, where they go, oh, okay, our customers are really into calendar apps. Let's have some articles on calendar apps and what makes them useful. Let's have a top 10 calendar apps. Let's have this. And that's useful content. That's useful content on their website. And so you can make the, the actual instruction manual, whether it's a PDF or more blog style, you can literally have the instruction manual be super concise, but then it says, this is how you install apps and explains it really clear and concise. But then there's a little bit of a cross sell there where a little bit of a, a interlinking where you say, if you're interested in calendar apps, because we know a bunch of you are right, click on this button and you click the button and it takes you to the blog post about the calendar apps. And now you've gotten two clicks out of it, right? You've gotten more traffic, more ad views, et cetera. And it's still useful. It's a, it's a clear, concise, defined piece of content. Now, the big thing that you're trying to avoid, in my opinion, and this is controversial, is that you're trying to avoid a big, visually flashy marketing website that is just covered in images, videos, and animations. Now, I'm not saying these websites are bad, but a lot of these websites, because they're so flashy, they contain so few words that making in-depth content is really really difficult to literally place in these sites because you got stuff flying in there's videos coming in and you're not going to have this sort of like really nice and cons and um in terms from a design perspective you know everything's like very clean there's not many words it's very concise in that way right there's a, maybe a video here but then you're not going to scroll halfway down and then have this massive paragraph or like 15 paragraphs talking like why is there a blog post in the middle of my page or it's hard to put content in them and that's why you know you have a blog section usually of your site but the thing is, from a, web from a web development agency perspective, is that that flashy marketing website that isn't, doesn't have a blog is usually really expensive. You've, you've done a lot of uh, optimizations. You've done a lot of things to make sure the animations and the videos and the images and, the, and all this stuff loads well and works and is responsive that the client goes, okay, I don't need a blog because I don't want to spend more time on this project and I don't want to pay more either. It is very difficult to sell a customer on something that is a little bit more basic that will probably rank better, like a more basic marketing site and get a high, get a higher rank on Google. They kind of off the top of my head, I'm sure there's other ways to do this, but off the top of my head, if they want the flashy website, that's great. But then they should have a nice, clear, concise, easy to read. Like the blog is meant to be read. You don't want the, 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 the font like fading in and out and like pop-ups and crap. And I know that some of the pop-ups convert and that's not what we're here for today, but you, you want the, the blog section to be something that is designed for people to read and generate leads. That's what you that's what you're trying to do. And it's really difficult to get a customer there. If they just want the flashiness, they're probably not going to rank well. I feel like this is really difficult to do. Like you mentioned it at the very start of the section, like it's writing more content sounds easy. But the more you kind of talk to clients, the more you've done this, like we've, we've done it so many times now for different clients. The barrier is like, I just don't have time. Like I, I need this website up. I don't have time to write 15 articles on plumbing, right? Like at the end of the day, like a plumber, yeah, they would benefit from a blog, in my opinion, right? Like they would benefit from like a how-to guide on how to install a bidet. They would benefit from comparison of different, like whatever, the shower heads, whatever promotes their business, right? Like whatever, whatever someone would find them on and click on it. But the problem is, is that, the cost benefit analysis for them is that like they might get a bunch more traffic, but local traffic might still be the same. Right. So I, I write more content makes sense from a grand perspective, but it, it won't make sense for every single one of your clients is what I'm trying to get to. Not everyone needs to have a blog. And in fact, it's if you notice that the client is or the customer or whoever is pushing back on being able to write content, in my opinion, it's better to just get rid of it. And and I'm curious to, to know to know to know your side of it, but like for me, if I see a website with a, with a blog that's not updated, I immediately kind of think less of that company because I'm like, oh, they don't, they're not around. Like they might have been, they might have you know thought about this website like five years ago, but they're not around anymore. So maybe they're you know they're not even a serious like plumbing company. Like it's a random thing to think about, but like 
I I associate that kind of recent recency to whether you're involved in the business or not. So not having a blog in that situation is kind of almost better for me, um, regardless of the SEO. But for sites that obviously benefit from it, right? Like sites that are driven by ads, sites that are driven to to sell like a, a SaaS product. A SaaS product is a perfect thing. Like if you if you have a SaaS product where someone can sign up straight from your website and start using it, it it's a no brainer to hire someone to keep continually write content for you, right? Because the more people see your site, the more reputation it has, the easier it is for people to convert. And it, the conversion is a button on your website rather than a call to a local plumbing company. So it, it's one of those balanced things that not everyone should have a blog. If you do, if you do, like you need to really think about the time investment, the cost investment, like this is not something that should be on the side, really. This is something that should be a, a kind of a main focal point of this marketing build out that you're doing for a website. If it's not, then get rid of it. And I'm really glad you actually brought that up because this episode is kind of talking more or less about keyword research and writing and stuff like that. However, there are some companies, like you said, that don't have you know time to do blogs and many, many blogs to to fight your sort of date thing of like whether they're around. Many blogs won't post the date that the uh, the posts are on now. Some of this is some of that's detrimental because Google will also look at the date and sometimes it'll look at and it's smart enough to look at and say, oh, there's an updated date. OK, maybe this article is more relevant again because there's there's a, an inherent. See, this is starting to get into the weeds and this is not what I wanted to uh, wanted to like get into. But it's like just to touch on it. So you understand what I'm saying is like if you had like a guide that would benefit from being updated every year. Um, you can actually go in and like update the title to say like, oh, it's, you know, the best web hosting 2024 this time. And I've updated it. And the link equity, the fact that Google has ranked that content high, let's, let's assume, well, then it'll come in and, you know, check it every now and then and be like, oh, it's updated this time. And it'll update it. And you keep a lot of that link equity. You're not starting at square one again. And so updating articles is is absolutely a strategy that a lot of these companies will employ. But like Mike, what you said, and this is a very good point, is like if you just can't do it. You only have like two blog posts and you don't have the dates even and you just can't get through it. And and you're right. People will look at if stuff is supported. There's a lot of that now where with the advent of the Internet, with the advent of updating software, updating video games, updating apps, the whole like list goes on. People will go, oh, well, is this game supported? And it's like, man, that that's something that, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago was never a thought. It was sort of like, oh, I bought this thing. It's on disc. It's like a CD of music. It's a game on a disc, whatever. I play it. It's done. You know, and then and then that's it. You can replay it if you want, and that's the end of it. It's not, oh, is is this still supported? Does it come with anything? You know, whatever. The the consumer mindset has absolutely changed. And people will look and say, Oh, this, yeah, like this this person hasn't been around in three years. Are they even like are they even around anymore? Right? Is are they are they still present? You know, where where are they? Um, and I do want to mention one other thing is that videos are also great for SEO. Google will if you have a how-to video uh, and it's like, well, you know, really concise in that, Google is smart enough to go in and if someone asks a specific question about like, oh, how do you, you know, do X and your one video has maybe 10 topics covered, but they're all related, it'll actually highlight and say, oh, that you know, this is the video you want to listen to in the uh, search engine results page. It'll say, this is the video you want to listen to and you want to listen to timestamp, you know, one minute through three minutes out of the 10 minutes. So it is smart like that. And I do... Um, specifically with trades companies, I'm trying to get something repaired, like an appliance company or something. A lot of the time I will look around, see that they do tutorials on YouTube, watch them do it and go, oh, okay, this guy clearly knows what he's talking about. And I've called them, right? Like that is a way to convert people. So it doesn't have to be a blog. There's other ways to get SEO. YouTube channel is one of them. And you can have video posts on your website and stuff like that. Like this is like this, the, the stuff that I'm covering today is really just sort of, it's a good amount of content that I'm going to talk about, but there it's just kind of scratched at the surface. And there's going to be people out there that disagree with me. There's a lot of different opinions in SEO and it's, it's a big, like it's a big industry. There's a reason why some SEO agencies do not make websites because they're just doing SEO, right? Many of the, many of the companies that do SEO do websites and some of the people that do websites don't do SEO. So it's just a big industry um, that you can either touch on or get really in depth. And it's a, it's a big thing. It's, it's really big for marketing. And this is why I want to, I want to just touch on this next topic. And I want to be clear that 
this isn't something that you can necessarily get done today, right? This website or this 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 whole episode is kind of talking about, you know, I can log in again, log into my CMS and just sort of imp- start implementing this stuff. You can kind of get started on this, but this is more of a like lifelong, meaning like your website lifelong sort of pursuit. And I'm talking about backlinks and DR. So backlinks, specifically good backlinks are really difficult to get. And even though, you know, you can take actions, of course, and you could do them today. It's less of a, hey, let's let's get this done today, because what a backlink is, is it's someone else linking back to your website. So somebody like if you're in the video game industry and you write a story and then IGN, one of the top, if not the top websites in terms of traffic in that niche says, oh, you know, this is this story that we're talking about at this blog post on IGN. It was reported by your website. They've linked back to your site. That's a good backlink to have. Right. And so writing good content, like I'm saying, writing more content, writing good content may naturally get you backlinks like that. And that's a good backlink. There are bad backlinks from things like click bills and stuff like that. We're not going to, again, get into all that stuff today. But the thing is, is that you can pursue good backlinks. You can find blog po- or blog owners in your niche, reach out and say, hey, I'll maybe guest post for you, but can I link back to my site? And it has to be, you know, you really do want a do follow link. You want it so that when Google crawls that IGN article, that it looks at the link to your blog and it actually follows it. And then you get some DR. So what's that? What What is DR? So DR is domain rating. And basically, it's a number uh, from one to 100 that indicates how authoritative your website is. And you can raise your DR by having, like I said, do follow links from other websites. I'm just going to read a quote here from Ahrefs, which is build more followed links to your website and your domain rate and your domain rating will increase. So I asked Google, like, how do I raise my DR? It's as simple as that. Just keep in mind that if the site you get a link from has a low DR uh, score itself or links out to lots of websites, the increase in domain rating may be negligible. So as you can see, there's already some nuance here. So like click mills are no good, those type of things. It's almost like buying fake Instagram followers, right? And sometimes these click mills, they just put your link in there without you asking. I'm not saying you're purchasing these backlinks, but you really want these good backlinks. You want you want to be working with um, people that are of equivalent or ideally higher DR. They have a good they have good authority. Um, they're relevant to your niche and that the backlink fits in, into their content naturally and is a do follow link. But as you can see, it's going to be easier said than done. Calling up randomly like IGN or calling up the Homes on Homes blog and, you know, whatever else, like the Mike Holmes blog. Like, are you just going to be able to get on there? I mean, chances are no. You're going to have to prove yourself and yada, yada. So maybe you could take the initial steps today. But in the sort of interest in moving this episode along, it's more of a, hey, I'm going to write a lot of content, get a lot of stuff. Maybe some people will even reach out to me because they like my writing. So then I can link back to, I can get those backlinks. Um, I can approach them now and say, hey, I have a hundred articles under my belt. I have 30 articles under my belt. Uh, you know, would you like me to write one for your site? You're not just showing up with one article written and they're like, oh, like this guy is just looking for a backlink, right? So it is a little bit weird and a lot of guest posting uh, was sort of public. You could just fill out a form and kind of get accepted. Some of that still exists 100%, but it's much di- more difficult. A lot of those programs have shut down. It's not easy to get on to uh, high authority, sort of really popular websites. It's very difficult. So with all that being said, you know, we talked about writing content. We talked about this. You might be like, well, okay, like oh, I'm going to sit down and write about my, my, my niche. My niche is waterfalls. Sure. I'm going to sit down and write, write about it. Some of the most obvious things might be like, oh, I'll talk about Niagara Falls. I'll talk about these smaller waterfalls. I'll talk about these tourist attractions. But you're going to run out of content pretty quick. And those are going to be really competitive. So you may not rank above something like a Travelocity or whatever, like a a travel website, like a TripAdvisor or something that maybe have already written on it and has high authority. So it's like, okay, you may struggle to get in. So you're thinking, okay, well, I just spent all that time writing you know, this isn't good. Like I'm spending all this time writing. I'm not getting much traffic. What do I do? And to me, I think what you do is you learn keyword research. So keyword research is not an easy skill to learn, period. And therefore it adds a high barrier of entry for those that just want to hit the ground running on content creation. However, to me, I think that the time spent learning keyword research is actually an investment in your future content. It's almost like giving it a buff, if you will. Where it's like, oh, okay, like all my content in the future will have a higher chance of success. So I may as well learn this. 
And I do want to cl- be clear here with a with a disclaimer that there are no guarantees when it comes to this SEO stuff. There's no guarantees that your content will rank well, even if you do your keyword research perfectly, of which perfectly asterisk, because God knows what perfect keyword research is. And content that has ranked well in the past may not continue to rank well in the future. Your your topic may become very competitive. Someone might come in and be out your article. Your content may become irrelevant to the people at large. So there's no guarantee of your content continuing to rank well. I'm going to share how I do my keyword research. This is inspired largely by Income School, which is a YouTube channel. I watched a bunch of their older videos uh, a couple of years ago. I still watch the odd video that they have now. I'm going to link them in uh, the show notes, of course. But my keyword research is largely inspired by them. But also, I picked up a lot of things along the way. So this is my process. I choose a topic that I want to write about. So for example, let's say I want to write a CSS how-to guide. That's really common for me. I want, to write, I want to write an instruction manual on some sort of CSS feature. So I go to a fresh incognito tab, right? Or an in-private browsing tab. And I go to google.com specifically. Now you can go to a Google dot whatever it is in your specific region. I know I could go to google.ca for Canada since we are Canadian, but the American market's larger. So I'll go to google.com. And I will type in, without pressing enter, I will type in CSS how to. Now, Google's going to start suggesting things, right? It's going to su- suggest some auto completion, like, oh, you know, look at all these things that you may want to search. These are clearly things that people are interested in, in reading or in, uh, in searching for, because Google wants to help them get to the search faster, get, get, get through the search faster. So I use, I use this as a tool. So what I say is I, I go, okay, CSS how to, I have not pressed enter. And I start entering letters of the alphabet. So I go CSS how to A, and I see all the A's. Like CSS how to A, and there's all the suggested ones. I go B, same thing, all the way through Z. Now, I don't necessarily go through all the letters all at once. I know that one of the income school, and this is me quoting from years ago from memory, so I might be a little wrong here. They recommend you come up with this big list of what you want to write about by going A through Z using this method and choosing all the things you're interested in, and then you whittle that that list down via some other things, via some other methods. And for me, I don't write enough, right? I'm doing a podcast stuff. I'm doing this and that. I'm running around. So I don't write enough. So I just find a topic that I'm interested in, right? And once I find that search query that I like, I then click on that search query. So now Google has searched it. And I will then analyze the SERP or the search engine uh, results page for some key things. And I ask myself these questions and, and, and think about these things. So chosen a query, I clicked it. What's on the SERP? Are there a lot of articles that already cover this topic? What are the qualities of those articles that already cover this topic? Now, at this point, after asking those two questions of myself, once I've you know looked at the looked at the actual articles, taken a peek, gone, whoa, these are like a lot more in depth. Maybe my, maybe I'm misinformed, and the stuff I was going to write about CSS is a little bit dated or something, or, or is not as efficient or something like that. So like their article is just better. If I think that particular search phrase is too competitive, I will begin my search on a fresh incognito window. I will close the incognito window out completely because I want fresh data. I don't want any Google suggestions based on my previous searches. And I go back to Google.com on a fresh incognito page and I start it again and go CSS how to A, B, et cetera. Now, let's just say the search phrase wasn't too competitive and I've decided I'm going to continue. I've decided that there are that like how many articles there are that call, that, that uh, cover the topic what their quality is. So I think I can, I think I have a chance of getting on, you know, getting in here somewhere. doesn't necessarily mean I can get to number one, but I have a chance of getting in here. So now I start looking at other things. Okay. What are the suggested searches or the people also ask part of Google? And I look at those and it says, you know, people may ask like CSS, how to align text centered. And let's say the people also ask, how do I align images centered? It's like, Oh, okay. Interesting. Maybe that's another idea. Maybe that's something that I can write about in this. Maybe I should actually write about centering stuff in general. So what I do oftentimes with the people also ask is I will try and incorporate these phrases into my content, even as a heading, if possible. So if I'm doing a how to, I will literally have like the beginning is like, how do I center the the, like the main, main, main heading? The page title is like, how how do I center uh, items or elements, whatever I've decided uh, on with CSS and then. I'll have several ways to do it. This is how you center text. This is how you center. This is how you center images. But I will phrase my heading the same way as it's written or very close to how it's written in the people also ask. 
Now, I'll, I will also analyze what Google is suggesting in the top card, at, right at the very top. So sometimes if you search up a question, you know, how to do, how do I do this? Google has like a kind of preferred, let's say, result where it pulls us a little excerpt from someone's article and it has the link to the article there and it'll it'll actually like kind of write out that part so you can actually see the result and your answer right in Google. And I will also analyze that there because that's the that's the you know creme de la creme. That's where you want to be at the end of the day, but it's hard to get there. And I will try to figure out how to, you know, get in there and kind of steal that as well. I'll kind of I'll look and be like, oh, you know, like that, you know, their answer is a little dated. Maybe I can get in there and write a little better. Oh, you know, it's not keyworded out enough. You know, without keyword stuffing, maybe I could get in there. And then that's what I start doing. And then I start writing. And what I do when I start writing is I actually write oftentimes a lot, not always, but oftentimes I'll write all my headings in the hierarchy. Okay, this is going to be my H1. This is my H2. This is my H3. I'll have another H2 down here. I'll have this H2 have two subsections. So, you know, an H3 and an H4, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All right. I'll write all those things. And then I have a uh, sort of a structure I can start. And then I just start writing. And oftentimes a lot of those headings get cut because I'll be like, oh, I'm reiterating, reiterating, reiterating too much. Doesn't sound good. I'm keyword stuffing. Boom. Kill that heading. Maybe even amalgamate the heading make it a subheading, et cetera. The, a lot of this stuff I've like kind of taken over over the years or like learned over the years. And you may have your own unique flavor to this. Again, this is my procedure. Is it perfect? Absolutely. 100% not. A lot of my articles don't rank, but a lot of my articles do rank. And I do want to say something about the headings. That's really important here is that I find that the headings, and this is again, personal information. I did not do a mass survey or anything like that. I think that the proper writing of headings and the proper breakdown of like if it's a how to, sometimes I'll write the heading like, how do I center text in CSS? Then And then my next heading might literally be like, step one, get your HTML. Step two, do this in your CSS. Step three, test it, things like that. I don't always do that. But if the steps are in depth enough, I will do that. Having really nice, concise headings gets me into, into these AI chats. The specifically Copilot, there's a few of my articles where I'll type in the exact query that I typed in originally back in the day. And it literally comes up with me and it's like, step one, you do this, step two, you do this, step three, you do this. And that's literally my steps exactly in the order. And then it has my HTML, the things.com, you know, this has been, this is where this is from. And then people could click it. So AI is something that we have to consider in this day and age as well. And AI might tear up all this, all this SEO stuff that I'm talking about right now, but I'm talking about today. Remember SEO tips you can implement today as of recording this. Yeah, I mean, SEO is changing so often that it's like today might be different from tomorrow. But I th- I think a lot of what you're saying is pretty evergreen. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with this. This is why I haven't ch- chimed in too much in this episode. But I will chime in on one particular thing that I have experience with. I've written a fairly successful SEO to shit article for Scrimba. This was like a year ago now. I can't even remember. It, it did pretty well. Very well, uh, very well, I would say myself. Yeah, like it, it did very well. And it, it was kind of SEO to the maximum of our ability from myself and as well as like Scrimba side and Matt's like we followed a very, if not exact copy of what Matt's saying. So started with the headings, like literally checked all the headings that I came up with against the against the same method that Matt's doing through the uh, the SERP and stuff like that, like made sure that every heading had a chance to click, had a chance to hit, uh, refined headings, removed headings, stuff like that. Like we spent probably a week going back to forth before I had the outline fully finished, right? Like it wasn't like every day, eight hours a day, but like every day we would touch, we would touch base and we would make sure that the, the outline was there. Only when the outline was hitting on ter- in terms of like the SEO side and a content side, obviously, like we're not just worried about SEO, but SEO is important. Uh, did I start writing the article, right? Um, so this is super important. Uh, if you're writing without at least having some of this in mind, you're almost wasting your time. Like you're you're almost writing to nobody. You're writing into the abyss. Um, you need to have a way for people to find your article. And this is the way, right? The questions that people would, 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 uh, would ask right as headings in your article, you know, include a lot of SEO material. Like, You don't, again, no keyword stuffing, but make sure that when you're talking, you're not talking in abstracts, you're talking very directly. Like our, my article was about React and Svelte. I had a lot of information about React and Svelte in there. I explained what each one was separately. 
I did comparisons. I, you know what I mean? Like I, I did as much as I could to make it so that a person coming to the article could get to the conclusion without having, with having pretty much zero information, right? Like as long as they understood web development, they could get to the, they could understand the conclusion of the article as long as they read through it. And that provided again, enough SEO material to make that article fairly successful. So I don't, again, I don't have a lot of experience. That article did pretty well. I have other articles that have done terribly, but that was the only one that I applied this method to. So, you know, as a cherry picked experience, this method works. The one that Matt, Matt just uh, applied as long as you stick to it, right? Like as long as you actually go through and check, make sure that every heading has a meeting and stuff like that. I do want to actually touch on something there, Mike, is that there are some times that it makes sense to spend that much time on, on an article. And in your case, that it made a lot of sense. Absolutely. Because there may have been other people writing for the blog at one at one time, right? They were writing, you know, this was a, a mega blog post. Like this is a big blog post. But I do want to say to people that, you know, if you're a person that doesn't have a lot of time and you go, oh my God, like, a, you know, a week, a day, whatever Mike said, or well, I guess not a day, but several days that you spent going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, just on the outline. It's like, what do we, you know, I can't do that. There is a, you know, good enough sort of right you learn you're, you're going to learn this stuff and you're probably going to be writing to the ether for a while but then once one article hits you go oh, okay what did i do differently there and you look around you go okay maybe i'll try this oh that isn't the thing that got me oh okay let me try these other things so you don't have to be writing one article for that long but you can think of mike's example as a project where let's say you're 100 articles in your website's doing well and you go i want to have this monolithic talk about seo like yeah you better have some you better have some monolithic time behind that monolithic post you don't want to just have this super shallow you know sort of thrown together garbage you don't you do not want that so 100 percent, i agree with mike on uh spending time when it's monolithic but when you're just sort of writing like when i write my css how to's i was trying to think of a way to like smaller article maybe but that's not really the idea the idea is i'm trying to just teach you how to do something so i'm not going to spend like eight weeks on it right <laughs> unless i'm like really freaking strapped or something like that but i ain't spending eight weeks eight hours a day or even an hour a day you know touching that thing i might realistically put a day of work into something and then and then release it and i can always update change it and whatever later so if you're just one of the you know you're an evening writer you're just doing this as a side hustle after work it's still totally 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 doable but sometimes that time investment is called for but just you know kind of keep it in check don't be doing that for every single article you're not you're not writing like a super critical historical piece. Chances are, maybe you are, but if you aren't, don't worry about it. <laughs> now, one thing with SEO, and, and I'm sort of gone through the meat and potatoes of this episode. So I have two little areas I want to touch on it. One of them is technical SEO. I'm just going to touch on that at the end. And another thing is people are like SEO tools, SEO tools. Like I want SEO tools. Like how do you use them? Whatever. I don't actually use any sort of paid SEO tool at all at the moment. Uh, there's a couple I'm looking into that I might just because I'm getting a little bit more serious, but these are all free as of uh, recording this. Uh, first one is, is I use a bunch of Ahrefs free tools, their keyword research, uh, their domain, their DR uh, checkers, things like that. I absolutely use Ahrefs free tool set just to sort of get my bearings. Sometimes if I'm really struggling with that process that I outlined earlier, um, then I will you know go through that, go through one of these tools uh, from Ahrefs. Uh, another thing that helps me is uh, Google Trends. So sometimes like I want to talk about something that's say cutting edge tech or cutting edge business. And I'm like, man, is anyone searching this thing? Google Trends is a good way to check that. Of course, go in, take a look at it and go, oh, OK, you know, this is what's going on. Um, but, you know, it, it's being looked at a lot in, in, in France, but nowhere else. OK, we have to consider that. Like, do we want to have a translation of it, et cetera? So Google Trends. Helps me just sort of get my bearings in that way. I don't use any of these tools super, super, super in depth. I want to be clear. I do a lot of sort of that organic checking with the Google um, autocomplete. And that was, again, under or largely inspired by Income School. And there are older videos now that they had, but largely, um, largely inspired by those. And I do still send those older videos to my customers. And some of them have, have found success, and including myself. I have I've, I've found success on several of my articles. And the last one here is Google Search Console. I do really like this. So Google Search Console, some people get confused what it is. They think it's analytics. They think it's this, that's that. It's not. So what Google Search Console is, is it's basically your presence literally on Google. And it will tell you like, hey, we're, hey, we're ranking this. Hey, we're ranking that. Hey, we're ranking this. This is really critical because what it'll, what it'll tell you is, let's say, 
you wanted to write an article of like, how do I center things or center text in CSS? One of the things that it might tell you is it might say you're ranking for and getting clicks for or getting a lot of impressions from like you get to see all this. You get to see, am I getting clicks? Am I getting impressions? What am I getting? And it, it says you're getting it for how do I vertically center in CSS? And you're like, oh, shoot, maybe I should add a maybe I should add a piece about that. Maybe I should make another article about that because my article doesn't actually solve that query very well. There's another there's a reward system as well on Google Search Console where they kind of give you these little virtual trophies, but it, it gives you a sense of like, oh, OK, I'm getting more clicks. I'm, my website's having more presence on Google. It's having a bigger pull. Uh, I'm getting a lot of or or maybe the opposite. And you're like, why aren't I getting clicks? You go look. Oh, shoot. I am getting a lot of impressions, not a lot of clicks. Maybe my uh, presentation's not very good. Uh, maybe my title needs to be different, et cetera, right? Um, and that actually loops very nicely into sort of the last part of this episode, which is the technical SEO. I just want to touch on the technical SEO because technical SEO is important. You know, you should do it. It's almost like just making sure that it's clean, like a, like a road. If you think about this, like a road, a road that is like dirty, most cars can still drive on it. There's like sand on it and stuff. As long as it's not super deep and not super ridiculous, you can still see the asphalt. You can still drive on that road, right? For the most part. However, when the road is brand new, I mean, you probably want it to be clean, right? Like you don't, it'd be nicer to have it clean and it will benefit you a little bit. Like maybe tourists would be more, more impressed and things like that. Right. So it's kind of like crossing the T's dot in the I's. That's what a lot of technical SEO is. So I'm just going to get into that. So page title and description, I'm talking about the meta title and the meta description that will show up in the SERP. So when you have a just a title, it's literally the title tag in HTML. I call that the meta title. And that's because it's going it, it'll be the thing that Google sees. Same with the description. There's literally like a meta tag and then you're writing in the type description, blah, blah, blah. That is what you're writing. You're writing a description of your page. Now, I always do this for all my pages that I'm aware of. I probably miss some, but I always try to do it. I do this because it affects not only the Google results, but it also affects sharing on social media. I would like to say something here. The reason why this is not as important as it sounds is because you want to be in control of this, right? You want to be in control of your page title and your description 100%. And Google doesn't care. Google will change the title. It will change the description based on what it thinks that it's supposed to be. So if it thinks that you're sort of keyword farming or if it thinks that you are fishing for, you know, a bit more exposure than what your article actually has. It will just change the title. If it thinks there's a better suited title and description to what it understands is on the article, it will change it. So you're always at risk of it changing. However, a lot of the time, an, an indication of a good article, and not always, I want to be clear, not always at all. But a lot of the time, if you wrote a really good page title and really good description that that kind of get into the meat and potatoes in a summary form of what you wrote in the article, a lot of the time, Google will leave these alone. And that's usually an indication of a, of a pretty good article that's going to rank really well. I haven't done any sort of science on that or checks or anything. That's just my experience and what I've kind of seen. The next thing, though, I've talked about sharing on social media is OG image or open graph image. You want to make sure you have your open graph image stuff. And there's other tags that you can put in there as well. Um, there's an open graph description, open graph title, et cetera. Basically, what you want to do is any meta, you know, open graph or otherwise that is going to make your uh, pages share well on the platforms you care about. You know, do you care that if someone shares a link on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on on Discord, that a nice little uh, card, like really a content box appears where it has a nice picture, you control the title, you control the, the, the description. Do you want that? Or do you want to have like a broken or a generic, you know, article uh, title and, and description with like, a, it's almost like it's a placeholder. No, you don't want that, right? So it's kind of like presentation. If someone takes your thing and says, I love this article about SEO and they paste it on Facebook. You want your image, your page, your page title, your description to show up on that Facebook card. So that's just the OG image, but just open graph meta in general and any other tags that maybe the other social media uh, folks out there, there's, I'm sure there's others that they'll use, but many will just use the open graph. They'll just pull from that, but just check, you know, if you love LinkedIn, you post links and you're like, why do all my links look like garbage? Go in and make sure your meta is all set up because it's not just you potentially sharing it. It's other people. You don't want to look like a fool just to be blunt. And something I just want to I just want to stress. It's already talked about it. So I'm just going to stress it once and not going to continue is proper heading hierarchy is really, really freaking important. 
Oh, I did not do this. And all my articles were shite. I started doing this on top of my uh, process of SEO, which I've already described. Once I started, you know, sort of learning my own process and doing proper heading uh, hierarchy, I started showing up in the people also ask. I started showing up in an AI, et cetera. Proper heading hierarchy is super important because it tells Google what is important, what isn't, what's under what, what's a subtitle, et cetera. Use proper heading hierarchy, your H1s through your H6s, use it right and use it properly. And the very final point I want to bring up is performance. So performance is, is such a such an argument. I have arguments with the clients on this all the time, and I'm getting a little bit heated because the arguments I have with them are heated. And that is they want all this fancy media and the performance is not that great. Like it will, it's not horrible, but it's not that great. And they'll go in and they'll use an old PC or a slow internet connection and the and their site won't load super fast. They have an old smartphone or something, and they'll be like, "This is a this is a, a like lunacy. This is terrible." So I'll go to them and I'll say, "Okay, go to a really big website in the world right now that is related to you. Go to if you are what's an example? If you're a video game blog, go to IGN.com and see how IGN loads. Now, IGN obviously has a lot of a lot of history on Google, a lot of history just in the world. So like it's a bit of a different case, but just check their performance." What I'm about to say is, is performance does not matter as much as you think. Does it matter? Yes. If your website always takes 40 seconds to load, that's not good. But if your website is loading decently, and I do mean decently, like check on different internet connections, on different devices, old, new, slow, fast connections, et cetera, like do check. But if it is reasonable, you do not have to fix every freaking thing that shows up in PageSpeed Insights, which is another free tool I will include that tell you about, that tells you about performance. Absolutely fix as much as you as you can. This is again, you're crossing your T's dot in your eyes. And those tools like PageSpeed Insights and other SEO tools that check performance are great for you going in and saying, like, oh shoot, I didn't, I didn't uh I didn't compress those images. Yeah, of course, get every inch of performance that you can. But performance is a push and pull tug of war. If like the best performing page is just gonna be a blank page, but you can't just have a blank page. So the next step up is text. And so it's like, but I want images. So everything you add is going to hurt the performance in some way. I know there's some people that pride themselves on getting 100s and bought whatever, blah, blah, blah. But we have Mike and I have worked for large companies where we've checked our competitors who are beating us. And they had a 34, 29, 16 page speed score on mobile. And we had a 65. And And you'll have an argument with your client over it. And it's like, no, like... Ours is 65, theirs is 12. We're beating them. Relax. Like performance and technical SEO overall is not as critical as you writing good, concise content. Think about Google specifically. And I know we've only mentioned Google, but Bing is in there too. AI is in there too. Go and check, go and check what you've written and think of Google as a person that is just either skimming it or reading your article, in my case, with just a basic knowledge of formal English, right? Someone who is pretty well fluent, but doesn't understand the slang and stuff. Make sure it's concise and all that. And and in my experience, you will rank better than if, oh, yay, like SEMrush gives me 100 out of 100 on my search score. Like, of course, get as much performance as you can. I'm not trying to go after SEMrush. What I'm saying is, it's not, it doesn't matter as much as you think, because people will fight that to the death. I don't think it matters as much as you think. And I've asked experts and they agree. Just as another example of that, like your your goal should be to maybe beat your competitors, right? In the performance. So if your competitor is 12 and you're like 60, you're doing well. That's really where it matters. If you're way below your competitors in performance, then that could have an effect. But as long as you're above them or around where they are, it's not going to matter who who's there. What Where this comes up into play a lot is when marketing teams need to have an excuse on why they're doing poorly. And this is why it's been stressed so much, and this is why it's just a constant battle for devs, is that marketing teams will find an article online saying that performance has a huge impact on your results, and they're doing poorly that quarter, so they will be like, engineering needs to fix the the performance for us to do better. This is is as common of a situation as I could possibly tell you. When you're in a market, like an e-commerce website, I can guarantee you at some point, the marketing team will point at you and be like, you're the reason that we don't have our sales figures for this quarter. Okay. And you're going to have to fight it. 
So you need as much information as you possibly can on that. You need to fight them as much as you can, because at the end of the day, I can almost guarantee you, if you don't have, if the sales numbers aren't there, 99% of the time, it's not on the performance or even the tech or anything to do with the website. 99% of the time, it's either the product sucks, the product hasn't updated in, in a while, the marketing sucks, et cetera, et cetera. It, it comes down to how good is this thing? How well are people putting it out there, right? Like how well are, are, are your mar- is your marketing team writing the blog posts, p- putting ads in place, et cetera, et cetera, for people to be driven there? If it's a good product and the marketing team is good, it's going to do well. It can be on you know a, a 10-year-old WordPress website that has a 12 performance. It will still do well because that's how literally 90% of the internet is powered, okay? that it, Reality, reality check for everyone, okay? Could it do a tiny bit better if it went from a 12 to a 60? Maybe, right? Like there's a chance that it could, you, you, you could move the needle a little bit. Chances are no. It'd be nice to have is what it is most of the time. Yes, okay. So yeah, that, that, that's my spiel on the performance argument. I've had I've I've personally had this argument with marketing teams on several occasions, right? And I have personally seen nothing happen after performance upgrades. And the marketing team still going after someone else. Like the marketing team will go, "Okay, performance is fixed. We still haven't got the the thing." And then they'll point to some other team being like, "These guys, these blog guys didn't fix didn't do the job." Like it, it's literally just like them trying to justify their own existence and it just becomes an internal war. Um yeah, that not much you can do to avoid that, unfortunately. <laughs> it, it's it's a struggle. And and when I said, you know, it'd be nice to have, it's like, yeah, it'd be nice to have, you know, 100% perfect SEO performance, best technical SEO, best, I guess, literal or marketing SEO with your writing. Of course, it'd be nice to have. But as long as your website works and isn't absolutely ridiculously slow to the point where people literally think it's down and aren't going to show up, it is not as critical as you think, at least not right now. Will that change? Who knows? But Mike is 100% right about the office politics. And I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't even really think of that. Like, I guess like I'm I'm working with individuals, right? Small, medium businesses. So like, I guess it is a bit of office politics where they'll call me freak out. And it's and it, and it, and it does like you're saying, Mike, it comes in waves. Well, they'll randomly call me and be like, the site's not doing well because the performance is bad. And I'll be like, well, did you compress your images? They're like, it's too hard for me to do that. I didn't ask you if it was too hard. Just compress your images. Also, by the way, the site's not taking 90 seconds to load. So it's probably not going to help that much. Correct. Like, yes, compress your images, of course, but like, relax. Also, like, look at different ways to rank. You can't. Not everything's performance based. Big old argument every time. Big mess. But I think that's it. That concludes. That concludes my uh, spiel on uh, SEO that you can get started on today. Uh, I think this is going to spark uh, me to like, actually want to write a bit of uh, some SEO content because like, there's a lot of little nuanced things that I wouldn't mind touching on. Maybe even like reviewing some tools or something, not promising anything, just something I'm thinking of. So maybe I will do that on the blog and maybe share it on the podcast or something like that moving forward. But that's it from my side. Mike, do you have anything else to add? No, I think I'm SEO'd out. SEO'd out. Search engine out. Search engine optimized out. SEO. It sounds like someone's position, like CTO. Well, SEO'd CEO. out, right? Like SEO'd out. But I still I still have the double O there. Search engine optimized out. Can we now make... I'm just completely out. <laughs> I was gonna say, can we make your position at the company like what whatever it is, like not CTO, not developer, SEO. <laughs> People like what? optimization like, officer c chief seo o chief search engine optimization officer is that like c c so kind of would people like shorten that to c so hey it's the c it's the c so like no please do not make me that <laughs> out of all the things <laughs> i don't i don't want that resident s c I can't even remember. You said it. It's it, it's in it's in print. It's in the recording. Anyway, if you want to support episodes like this, uh, you can do so via supporting us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash HTML, all the things. And many thanks to our three dollar tier patrons, Tim from the Web Hacker, the Webhacker.com, Jason from Geek Life Radio via geeklikeradio.com, Fire and Season via Fire and Season.com, Garrett Segal, Level Up Financial Planning via www.levelupfinancialplanning.com, and Joshua via Silvio.us. I'd also like to give a shout out to Michael LaRocca, a contributing author on HTML, all the things.com. Michael is the author of the self-taught, the X generation blog at self taught txg.com. Remember that we also have a Scrimba affiliate link. If you want to learn with an interactive media player code editor, learn how to code 
go and do so. Link will be in the show description as well as on HTML, all the things.com in the show notes. And feel free to leave a comment or a review in the platform that you are listening to this on. And this outro will sign us off. You've been listening to HTML, all the things podcast, web development, web design, and small business. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from this show. And we hope you appreciate that. We talk to you like human beings and we hope you had some fun. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, hit us up on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon at HTML, all the things and on Twitter at HTML, everything until next time. This is HTML, all the things signing off. We'll be right back. We'll be right back.